You're listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on the IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon and welcome to The Legal Connection with Tony and Cheryl. Tony Lynn Collins and Cheryl Ellsworth Jahani. We are two Texas licensed attorneys and we are here on 104.5 and 106.1 every Tuesday from 12 to 1 talking about legal topics, discussing legal topics. Uh, you can listen to us live on Facebook and you can also download the podcast tomorrow on Google Play and iTunes. Tunes. So today, Tony and I are going to be talking about uh, the pros and cons of pleading guilty. We're going to have Tony. We're going to give a, a quiz on what you know about. <laughs> we're going to do multiple choice, so our listeners and our station manager and we can just see how well we are abreast of what's going on with uh, the law, constitutional law specifically. And um, we're going to go over the do's and don'ts of after being arrested. We're going to go over um, uh, whether or not uh, what's going on with Bitcoin and money laundering. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know this is dumb, but the reason is because we been, we um, we went through uh, this weekend instead of doing our usual old movies and doing work that we were supposed to be doing. We uh, binge watch Breaking Bad. Oh, did you really? Uh, because the new season was coming up, and they had like oh. a marathon, and um, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, which of mm -hmm. course is all criminal and there's money laundering and all that stuff, and 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 plus I've got a lot of criminal cases right now, so I thought, well, let me. I think some of our listeners, if they're watching the new season of Better Call Saul, are they're interested in that? A lot of our clients will be that will kind of give them a little primer on okay. that. Okay. All right. So, um, and, but I did want to uh, say real quick, uh, uh, or, or go over real quick, an experience that I had this week with one of my clients, and I think that it uh, will help some of the people in the Conroe area mm -hmm. that are uh, some of, uh, in our, our listening area specifically. But for the people that are on Facebook and, and, and it's more expanded, it may help them too. Uh, we have a lot of immigration issues here in South Texas, right? Um, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of split on on the one hand. I feel like, uh, uh, well, not even what I feel like, but but the laws provide that there are certain things you have to do uh, b before crossing over to the United States, or you'll get in trouble, right? Right. Um, and if you go through a checkpoint, uh, and, and you've and, and you've done the right things, and you just cross right on through, right? Right. Um, but if you don't go through a checkpoint, or if you get to the checkpoint, you don't have the right paperwork then you're going to be held. Depending on which country you came from, you're not going to be able to go through now with the way the administrative have made the laws. They will hold you in Mexico on the other side of the border in a holding facility until they, you get a, a, a preliminary hearing or an arraignment to determine whether or not you qualify to be able to come over to the United States and, you know, uh, and be permitted to be here, right? Right. Okay, well, uh, here in Conroe, we've got a... Uh, uh, what do you call it? It's a uh, uh, it's it's a day labor camp, uh, uh -huh. and it's uh, the, the the day laborers have got uh, some kind of deal with the city where they don't bother them. And the day labor camp is for people who uh, just want to work for the day. And many many of them are here legally, but a lot of them aren't. But they don't get bothered, and people pick them and use them. And a lot of the people that go to the day labor camp um, are have had permits that have expired or they've been here a long time, like 30 years, and they've never gotten their paperwork completely taken care of. Hmm. So they're not here legally, but they've been here a long time. And they are amazing workers. And mm, right. you really don't know when you get somebody to come help you with your lawn or some work. And you're kind of quizzing them, uh, basically interrogating them about their, their background. But you really don't know when you're getting them for the day what you've got. And a lot of times they'll lie, well, uh, about being here uh, legally. And mm -hmm. and you're usually paying them a day rate, and that will go, oh, I don't know, generally between, depending on, uh, you know, what you're using them for and what your industry is, it may be anywhere as low as $100 a day, which is really low if you're working them that hard, 
to maybe $250 a day, depending on what the skill set is, right? And so these are the guys that you just see, like, at Home Depot or well, in no, parking at, lots we're, that you pick up? Well, no, if they're at the day labor camp, the actual designated camp, right. um, our, our day labor, uh, I don't want to say camp, but the, the, the place where you go right here off of, um, I guess it's off of Maine, um, they, uh, it's almost, I want to say it's almost like a sanctuary for the day because mm-hmm. the police aren't bothering them because mm-hmm. really they help you out a lot. I don't know mm-hmm. what we would do without them down mm-hmm. here because um, uh, because they they have a skill set that's beyond belief mm-hmm. and you don't have to go to, uh, say, um, I, I don't know, you don't have to call uh, 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 handyman or us. Handyman or us or whatever. Yeah, you don't have to call them and... And you basically can drive up and say, I need a lot of people today to do some cement work or whatever, right? Well, I had a client call me and tell me that he had a, and he's here legally, but he had a cousin that got picked up at the border. And um, he crossed over. Apparently, it's commonplace, you know, to go back and forth. They, they, they work here for a limited period of time, and then they go back home again. And while they're here, they're paying sales tax and all that stuff. But this guy had worked in Chicago, and he got picked up for... Um, family assault, and um, he actually pled guilty to it, and we'll go over that a little bit today, the pros and cons of pleading guilty, but he pled guilty, and he was actually in jail for about two years. In Chicago? uh, In Chicago, and then uh, he was deported, and when you're deported, there's different, um, they tell you when you leave that (coughs) you've got certain time periods before you can come back, you can attempt to come back to the United States again. Uh, legally. Right. And um, depending on the crime you committed. But if it's a felony, generally it's going to be 20 years, an aggravated felony. And I guess this must have been an aggravated assault. And it's not, it's very easy to get an aggravated assault right. because someone just has to accuse you. And right. then if you don't have an attorney, just to get the best deal you can, a lot of times you plead that. Right. And we're going to go over the pros and cons of pleading because sometimes you, hadn't, you didn't even do it. Mm-hmm. You just want to get out so badly right. that that these people will take a plea, and sometimes that's not in their and best interest. And you feel like they're going to get you anyway, so. Right, right. And so they, they, they're they sort of pressured into it, and it seems win-win at the time, but a lot of times it's better to be patient than to take the first deal uh, that's offered you, particularly if you're innocent, and or if you've got a good affirmative defense, if it was mutual combat or whatever. So, um so anyway, um, I had uh, th- th- my my clients couldn't find their cousin, and that was the dilemma. Is we've got our friend, we don't know where he's at. He was picked up at the border, we don't know where he's at. And so, what I was going to tell our listeners is how you have to go about finding them. I had no idea. The guy had the most common name ever. It was like you know Juan Diaz, and uh, no middle name, and everybody in the world is named this. And a lot of times they don't even give the real name, so you don't know how to find them. Well, we ultimately were able to find him by kind of, uh, I had to look in the federal system. I had to look at all the jails, couldn't find him anywhere in the jails. Finally ended up calling the federal system and just explaining uh, to the, the, the U.S. Marshal's office, you have to call different areas. I called the U.S. Marshal's office and I gave him this name and I gave him the guy's date of birth. And they were able to find um, 282 people that matched this name. But we were a- able to narrow it down to when he got picked up. They knew when my client knew when right. he wasn't, when, when the last time he was there was. And we were able to narrow it down. We found him. We couldn't believe we found it. And it would wow, have been Tony, that's extremely great. difficult for my clients to track it down without an attorney because. Uh, it, it's uh, there's so much confidentiality and the U.S. Marshals and the federal system and, and ICE are not giving you any information at but all. But they gave you information. They did because I was an attorney. Right. And so um, so I was able to track them down. And usually you can find some, um, you know, you always want to serve God by serving others. And if somebody's looking for somebody and they're, you know, they're desperate to find out if they're dead or alive or where they're at, right. then of course I'm going to help them. And mm-hmm. so I was able to track it down and find out where that I got after talking to the mar- the the, the uh, federal marshals o- U.S. marshals office, they wouldn't give me any information to like, explain the situation. You know, it was on the up and up. Gave my bar number and all that. Uh, they gave me the guy's um, uh, criminal number, so I looked it up in Pacer, found him, and determined that he illegally entered 19 years after he was told not to enter it for 20 years. So he missed his deadline by a year, right. and so when he crossed over, they detained him. And they, they held him in a, um, a federal ICE facility. Well, we still, uh, then I looked it up today to find out what the status was because his wife's pregnant and they were looking for him. And it ends up that they had terminated his case. And I thought, great, he's been released. We just need to find him again. But that's not what happened. They terminated his magistrate case and they reopened it as a criminal case 
assigned him a public defender, which you only don't get when you cross over. Right. Because now it was criminal in nature. And his arraignment is going to be today. And um, is he, where is he? Where did he cross over? Um, he in crossed Texas? over at a very standard place. Um, he crossed over near Hidalgo. And usually when you're deported, you're deported at... They, they, they bus you to Laredo, which I think is like the closest um, point, um, exit point from the United States to Mexico, maybe Laredo if you're coming from San Antonio or Houston. There's probably other closer places, but from the Houston area, I know that all my clients get deported to Laredo. Mm -hmm. They give them a certain amount of money and then maybe $100 or something. And then from there, they've got to call the relatives to get where they need to go. A lot of them have walked. You know, it's just really a sad situation that they paid a coyote yeah you know, $8,000, and then they're caught, you know, crossing over. But And the coyotes are the ones making all the money in this whole thing. Right. It's not the people coming over. They're being lured over, telling them everything's fine. For sure. And so it's really kind of sad. But we did find him, and it ends up that his arraignment's today. And I believe because the, um, the, uh, the criminal penalty for your first time of coming back over when you're not supposed to after having an aggravated felony... Um, or, or any time that you cross over, but particularly they're going to hold you under those circumstances, is only six months if you haven't done anything else but cross back over again. But it depends. Everything depends. It depends on the felony. It depends on, you know, everything. If you've been honest and you know, with your officer like you always want to be, you never want to lie to a police officer. That's a felony on top of a felony. Right. So it's best, and we're going to go over that today, your do's and don'ts when you're arrested, it's best to say nothing at all but not to lie. That's... That's just the worst thing that you can do. And so anyway, we found him. He's arraignment today. We believe that because the penalty is only up to six months, he'll probably, the arraignment and the preliminary hearing are kind of similar. We'll talk about that again today also with the differences. Um, he'll probably be cut loose today, and, you know, he'll probably be told not to come back again. Your penalty for doing that is is a higher penalty. You know, it goes from five years, 10 years, mm -hmm. 20 years, and then you can't come back again. And a lot of these people will take the risk, but I think once you've been incarcerated for a while in the federal ICE detention, usually it's not, it's, if it's economic, they'd rather just stay, you know, where they're at and, and mm -hmm. take the risk of, you know, being whatever it is, whatever made them flee, whether it's economic or they needed asylum, whatever. But I just want to go over that it's really, really hard to find somebody, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, you just need to call and not give up and mm -hmm. pray a lot. So um, that, that being said, I did want to go over the do's and don'ts after being arrested which kind of segues into that. Right. So, um, all right, so some of the most critical mistakes in criminal, any criminal case occur after a suspect has been arrested. Here is a list of things to do and not to do if you find yourself in that predicament. Okay. Okay. So um, what do you think is the first thing on this list when you're arrested? What is the first thing they ask you to uh, do? Ask for an attorney? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Who would have thought? You would think that we're trying to publicize. No, I don't want no, to hear from my... Right. Usually they don't have any money. I don't right. want to do their case. I've, I've got bigger fish to fry. But um, the very first thing that you should do if you're arrested is to request a lawyer. The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution gives individuals the right to an attorney after the arrest. Many individuals may fear that asking for an attorney makes them appear guilty. Right. However, asserting this right cannot be used by a prosecutor to make a jury draw an inference of guilt. Additionally, agreeing to talk to the police without a lawyer present will not change how an individual will be treated by law enforcement. However, agreeing to talk to law enforcement without a lawyer can lead to disastrous results. Yeah, sure can. And I can vouch for that because everybody tries to talk their way out of it. Right. And, all, and they've got a body cam on. They think it makes them look innocent to the police no officer. No matter what they say, whether they are sober, not sober... Anything you say can and will be held against you, and I cannot emphasize That's that so enough. true. Um, if they've stopped you, even on the best... Well, I, take, I know some police officers who are really nice. Right. But they already know the situation. They've seen this sure. before. They're seasoned. If they're nice, they're going to know if you say nothing just by looking at the situation, whether or not they're going to cut you loose or not. Right. So just don't say anything. Right. You know, just uh, we'll call your attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, make your request for an attorney clear and unambiguous. Otherwise, law enforcement may be able to get away with continuing questioning you. And I've mm -hmm. seen that before, too, and you learn that in law school. Once you assert your right to counsel, you should not be questioned again without your lawyer's consent. Because if you are, and it's clear and, and, and unambiguous, then your attorney can use your Fifth Amendment violation to get that dismissed because that is really a strong violation. Right. But it's, it's 
so seldom that you have the really smart people that don't try to talk their way out of it. Most people are aggravated they've been stopped or they're surprised or they think right. they've talked their way out of it right. because that's they've done it before. No, don't do it. Additionally, do not volunteer any more information until your lawyer arrives. Right. Don't, don't forget that don't part. do it. <laughs> right. Um, do call your lawyer first. Um, while and do actually call your lawyer. Right. Uh, while the immediate reaction of many people is to get out of jail quickly by calling a bail bondsman, the very first call you should make is to your lawyer, mm-hmm. not your bail bondsman. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, one primary reason for this is because bail is expensive. Mm-hmm. It may cost a person thousands of dollars to pay their share of the bond amount that will not be refunded to them. A lawyer may be able to get the bail amount eliminated or reduced. And I've done that a number of times. I've gone to that arraignment, the little video that you see where you, I have to, I hate it, but I will drive down there during their video arraignment right after they've been arrested and I will argue to that judge. Now, Harris County is a lot more difficult because they've got a bond schedule, but new laws have been passed in the federal courts because they were sued by people, uh, by, with a group of people, and it was, um, not the prosecutors, but uh, I can't remember who it was, but whoever sued them, and I knew the, the case, it's yeah, been yeah, fairly I rem- recent. Yeah, I remember that. They um, they made it, they said that people that can't afford bond are being, um, it, it, it was uh, an equal protection violation, mm-hmm. that you can't, just because somebody's really rich doesn't mean that they should, because uh, they, they can bail out, so it's nothing to them. People that don't have the means to bail out should get a proportionally lower bail because you're innocent until proven guilty. Mm-hmm. And they lowered the bond schedule for that. And in New York, they took it way further. In New York, they were letting people out that were, you know, by no means should ever have been let out, and they got out and they were killing people and oh, stuff. Gosh. We're not like that. We're very conservative here in 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 Harris and Montgomery County. We're not just going to let people out. But they did adjust the bond scale, and you can get out on a PR bond much easier now than you could before, and you just need to know about it. So calling your attorney if you can get a hold of them or having your loved one call an attorney before mm-hmm. you do anything and not saying anything mm-hmm. because anything you say in the jail is going to be recorded, right. particularly in Harris County. Just don't talk about your case. Just call an attorney and tell them you're in jail, and then that person can kind of explain the situation to the attorney that, that you want to represent them, and then you can kind of go from there. Um, during the bond hearing, a criminal defense attorney may be able to ask that you be released on your own recognizance, mm-hmm. which happens a lot, particularly in Montgomery County. They're good about they that. They are. That's yes. true. This means that the lawyer is asking you to be released without you having to pay the court any money so long mm-hmm. as you agree that you return to future court dates in your case. Right. Um, in some of these cases, the court may impose additional conditions, but monetary consequence in uh, the personal recognizance cases is not imposed unless you violate these additional conditions. So if you don't show up after you gave them a break or you do something dumb like break the law again or you, you know, smoke pot and they test you or whatever, you're going to be able to get out and not have to pay anything and because you are innocent until proven, proven guilty. Now, right. even if a person is not eligible for that, for the, the free bond um, or the personal bond, it may be preferable for him to, or her to delay bond for financial reasons. For an example, a person may not be arrested but ultimately not charged. Happens a lot when you go to the probable cause hearings. People get arrested. I was watching a, I was waiting for my case to be called and I was in court the other day and this guy was in um, a Walmart and he had gone to the dressing rooms and um, the security guard, the mall cop, said that uh, he went back, he followed him back there and said, you can't be back here because he didn't bring any clothes or something. It looked kind of shifty, but the guy didn't do anything. Well, um, when the guy, the guy got mad, he may have been trying on clothes. I don't know what the whole story was. It was because I was only getting the police version of it. But um, the security guard said that he, when he went back there, they kind of caught an, an argument and he showed him his gun, the, the guy that was back there dead. And they arrested the him. The citizen? Yeah, the oh, citizen. Oh, gosh. And the guy, and he was all tattooed out and stuff. And so the police officer said um, he was in, he was armed and he shouldn't have been armed. I forgot what the, the law was. It was, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, it's that, that exception where they've got something posted that you can't yeah, have a gun in here. Yeah, we went over that. that 6, 602. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, you can't. 1937. Uh, but he wasn't, but it ends up that he wasn't a felon. He mm-hmm. had every right to have a gun on him. He had a license to have a gun on him. And um, and they tried to convince him, even the, the prosecutors tried to convince the judge that there was probable cause to arrest him because he was threatening. And the judge said no. She said he was just back there and he showed you his gun. He might have, she goes, mm, because they've, the judges have heard it all before too. Sure. And they don't want their cases clogged with these dumb cases. Right. And so he was released. He was released. That's he was, fantastic. He was in jail for two days, but he was released and it was dropped and it didn't cost him any more money, but he was in jail for, for two days because in Harris County it takes a while to get before the actual judge if you stand your ground. 
So anyway, um, if that is um, if that is the case, bailing out immediately without a bail bondsman will cost the same because you're not going to get your money back if you get a bail bondsman. Mm-hmm. They love to take your money. Sure, uh, but you would have been released soon enough anyway without it. So you're not having to pay an attorney not to do anything, particularly if you know that there was no reason for you to be arrested. You might be mad, but you know it, it, it's things happen. Maybe it was good for you to cool off in jail or something. We don't know why God. These things are presented to us like they are. And he shouldn't have got showed the, in this case, he shouldn't have showed the guys. No, guy. he I mean, sure shouldn't So have. he was just being a hothead and he had to pay for that. Right. In other cases, the defendant may face a lower charge than the original one that was filed, in which case the bail amount will be greatly reduced if it goes from a felony to a misdemeanor. Oh, now, right. Um, um, the next thing is you do need to explain your arrest to your lawyer, but don't do it. Do it directly to your lawyer because lawyers, um, everything is confidential whether you visit them in person or you do it in, in, in jail, nothing you say to your lawyer can come out. However, if you tell a family member, that's not confidential. What about if uh, the family member tells the lawyer? That's fine. That's confidential. Um, well, the, if the family member tells the lawyer and the police don't know about it, then how would they know? Mm-hmm. I mean, because mm-hmm. there's no way of getting that information. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not confidential because you don't they're have They're not your a, client. Yeah, they're not your client. Mm-hmm. So you have to be careful, too. Uh, and that's why I, I don't, I have, you know, I, I be, I'm very careful about making sure that my witnesses are not known because you don't have to disclose that before a trial in criminal trials. You don't have to disclose who your witnesses are at all. The only ones you have to disclose are your experts. Right. So, and that's only if they ask for them too. But you have to disclose your witnesses right before trial. No, you don't. No, there's no no, no witness list. You don't have to. You don't even have to say anything. You just uh, call uh, them uh, up. You're innocent until proven guilty. You can remain silent the entire time. They've got right. to prove their case. The problem is, is that in criminal cases, usually a jury, it really is um, guilty, guilty until, until proven, proven innocent. innocent. Right. Uh, and so you've got to be prepared for everything. And so I've got. My witness is prepared and subpoenaed, and they will see if you subpoena somebody that doesn't want to testify. So they kind of, the, the prosecution is going to see who your witnesses are because they'll see your subpoenas. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have people that don't want to come in because they're afraid they may have some crimes or, you know, it's supposed to be a safe haven. You go to jail if you're a witness, they're not supposed to arrest you. But there was just a case recently that I saw on TV where um, people, and it was immigrants, it was another immigrant case, where mm-hmm. people were being um, subpoenaed to testify but they weren't here legally, and ICE was coming into court and oh, arresting gosh. them. And that's perfectly legal, but it's not generally accepted. It's mm-hmm. not the proper protocol. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's in the federal courts right now is this should be, you should be free to, if you're ordered to court, you shouldn't be afraid of being arrested because it taints your ability for a fair trial if your witness isn't a legal citizen or whatever. Right. Um, anyway, do you explain that? There are only a few scenarios um, where you don't, well, although you may need, you may think the police followed standard procedure when arresting you, your lawyer needs to hear the circumstances involving your arrest, the complete thing. There are only a few certain scenarios that can legally result in an arrest. Um, for an example, police can arrest a person who they personally observe committing a crime, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. However, this arrest power varies by jurisdiction depending on the seriousness of the offense. So if they're relying on a witness to tell you and they didn't witness it, they can't arrest you. However, another reason that a person can be arrested is if law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe that the individual has committed a crime. And that's like 95% of the time. The police are not going to catch you in a crime unless right. it's like a DWI and they're videotaping you or whatever. Um, in some instances, law enforcement officer may procure an arrest war- warrant for these purposes. And I would say that's almost always. They will rely on somebody saying this happened. And then that's when you have to, as a, a criminal defense attorney, you have to attack the veracity of the witness, what they saw, where they saw it from, you know, just like 12 angry men and the lady with the glasses and could they see and that kind of thing. Right. Um, um, Even if you believe that the police did not have a legal reason to arrest you, do not resist arrest or run away. I have a client that's all he ever does. He runs, runs, runs. He's now facing four misdemeanors, evading and running, and he really did need to run. He was nothing but bad news. And then after he was arrested and I got him out and uh, for running, for evading, um, he evaded again. <laughs> he just keeps evading. He's a runner. That gets you in more and more trouble when you run, people. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like I, I can't just – it's better just to show up than it is to run because running has the appearance of guilt. 
why wouldn't you just want to show up and take your medicine? Just to explain your situation. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people run because they don't want to be incarcerated. Mm-hmm. Um, doing uh, so may justify police using additional force to ensure your capture, which they do. Mm-hmm. They'll all, and they'll, they may turn it into a um, aggravated assault on a police officer, even if all you did so much is just to push their arm away or any kind of touch to a police officer is trying to arrest you. Mm-hmm. And that becomes, an, that becomes an assault on a police officer. Yes. And, and a resisting arrest. Mm-hmm. Depending on how mad they are, you, anything the police officer says is going to be more than what you say. Sure. Or what your client says. Mm-hmm. Um, additionally, you can face additional charges for such resistance, and mine always do. And so my clients have learned second time around that oh, if the police want to arrest you, you just turn around and let them arrest you. You don't argue. Just like we said. Just let it happen because mm-hmm. your attorney is going to be able to help mm-hmm. you if, if you are innocent. Mm-hmm. Um, next is don't reveal details during your phone call. Even though you have the right to contact a person if you have been arrested, provide only basic information about your arrest. Do not make any statements that you could later, that could later be held against you. Mm-hmm. First of all, you haven't retained that attorney. Although, if you do speak with an attorney, I think the privilege does apply. Right. But but if you're calling someone to pick you up, don't talk about it on the phone. It is they're listening. They're I happy know. to listen. Mm-hmm. That, they're all ears. This is great for them. They made sure. the arrest. You know. Um, <clears throat> don't agree to any test, please. People with DWIs and anything else you're arrested for. Do not agree to test. You don't have to. Everyone believes because the police officer is asking you for it. You don't have to. The only thing you have to do is give up, get, show me your ID. That's mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Everything else is a no. Talk to a lawyer before you agree to certain tests, and that mm-hmm. includes field sobriety tests, such as field sobriety tests, polygraph tests, or chemical tests. Some jurisdictions may require you to consent to certain alcohol-related tests as a condition of your license to drive in that state. So be sure that you ask your lawyer about any potential consequences for about your refusal. And, of course, we have that in Texas. Right. If you refuse, you'll be arrested. But if you really were drinking at all and you have a low tolerance or it may be on your breath or maybe you're a minor and you're not supposed to have any alcohol in your mm-hmm. system, even if with your, with your parent, if that parent's not there, don't agree to the test. Mm-hmm. You'll only be in jail for a, 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 overnight, a few hours, mm-hmm. and then it'll be dismissed. But once you give them that, that evidence, it's a much, much harder to get rid of and a lot more expensive to defend. Right. Um, do not consent to searches. Please do not consent to searches. When you're pulled over and they ask you to step out of your car and they ask you if you have anything in your car, and this happens all the time with teenagers and young adults, and you want to be honest, well, I've got a gun. The minute you say you've got a gun, the minute you say you've got anything in there, then you just opened yourself up to many more charges. Do not agree to let law enforcement search your property or your home in the case of your arrest. Say no. As many good police officers there are, there's a lot of really bad ones that plant stuff. Right. We know all about that. We just watched the one where the guy, they said they had a search warrant, even phony search warrants. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of bad cops out there. Right. There's a lot of great ones, sure. amazing ones, people mm-hmm. I'm really good friends with. I wish they were all like that. Mm-hmm. But some of them aren't. And mm-hmm. so you just have to be really careful and know your rights. Don't let them in. Even if they have a warrant, don't let them in. Because the warrant may not be valid. Right. And they may only be able to search certain things. And just say no. And if they come in, immediately get your cell phone and start videotaping. There's no law against that Mm -hmm. because it may be the only thing that protects you. Mm -hmm. All right. Likewise, do not agree to the collection of your DNA or other sample from you without first consulting a lawyer. And that, and you know, once again, it's do not let them in your car. Now they can search your car if they say we smell pot. They'll say what we had a right to. That's our probable cause. So the words, the wise, don't be lugging around contraband in your car. No kidding. I don't want a pipe in there. I don't want anything you shouldn't have in your car, in your car. And if you're using somebody else's car, teenagers, as happen, I'm representing so many juveniles right now, and ones that are just on the brink of being juveniles, do not um, drive a car or allegedly drive your friend's car that, that may not be somebody that you know well. Uh, because if they've got contraband in their car, you're going to be the one that's that's stuck with that charge. And it's really, really hard to get rid of that. If they've already st- pulled you over, you're, you're going to end up with a plea deal. And if you're a juvenile, great. It may come off your record. But if it's a serious amount and you're a juvenile, it's not coming off your record. You'll be adjudicated as an adult, even right. if you're 15 or 16, depending on the amount. And I think people know when there's a lot of stuff in their car. Mm-hmm. They're going to be, you know... Um, mm-hmm. they, you know, we had the one where I, I represented the guy like about 15 years ago, and he had 400 pounds of pot in his car over there off the, um, when it was the tollway. And right. they pulled him over, and he tried to say, I didn't know it was there. And he did know, right. ultimately. And I was able to get that case dismissed because he had a clean record and various other things. But he was in jail for six months until I got it dismissed because he was facing some serious federal 
uh, a crime Drug law. Traffic, and yeah. I got him dismissed on the state level, and then they picked it up on the federal level. So he didn't get out for a long time. So be really careful about who you get in the car with. All right, so. But don't consent to any searches or no any searches. specimen. The very best advice we have is call your attorney uh -huh. first. Right. And be careful what you say in front of police officers because they're most of them are trained. We have a lot of new officers out there that might be a little bit green, but most of them have supervisors that are watching, which makes just one more very clean, shiny cop to show up in court that, that will, in multiples, to make you look bad and it, it's pretty scary when it's you against five beautifully uniformed, no decorated cops. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the bad thing is a lot of times you really may be guilty of what they've charged you with, but you may have had a defense if you hadn't said anything. You may have just made one of those bad decisions that's forgivable and, and, um, you know, and, and probably defensible, but you've made mistakes on your way to jail. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what mm -hmm. do you have for us? Um, I have a pleading guilty or going to trial, the pros and cons of those, okay. okay? When a criminal defendant makes the decision whether to plead guilty or go to trial, he or she often has much more to consider than whether or not they're actually innocent. We mm -hmm. touched on this mm -hmm. a little bit earlier. The risks of being found guilty by a judge or jury are substantial causing some innocent people to plead guilty in order to avoid those risks. Right, right? because once they're in jail, mo if, if the bond is too high, because let's say they were falsely accused, and it's all the time that that a wife that finds out her husband's been cheating right. will fabricate evidence or for a divorce situation or a child custody situation. They're fabricating evidence, and they're, they're, they're manipulating the system so that this person will be out of the picture. Right. Um, short of killing them, this is the best thing they can do. Right. And their bond is set really high and they can't afford to get out. And they will do anything within their power to get out, and, and including pleading, taking a plea deal when they're innocent or it's defensible. Mm -hmm. A criminal defense lawyer can discuss the pros and cons, you know, like we've been talking mm -hmm. about. Talk to a criminal defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. Okay, the pros of pleading guilty. When a criminal defendant pleads guilty, he or she is confronting the case face on. This means that he or she will be able to resolve the case more quickly than if they waited a year or more for a criminal trial. And that's how long it takes in Harris County. If you are not out on bond, because the bond, uh, I'm sorry, the jail cases go first, but the jail, because it's such a backlog, even the people that are in jail that are not out on bond, it still takes up to a year and a half. And if you're going to go to trial, your attorney has got to get all the records required, subpoena those records, get it lined up, do all the pretrial motions, uh, develop your, your defense. That still takes time because right. subpoenaing the records and making them in a proper admissible form, uh, interviewing witnesses, it still takes a year, year and a half. And you may be sitting in jail that whole time. And I'm telling you, my clients get sick in jail. It's a grimy place. There's a lot right. of uh, tuberculosis and, and the quarantine and that now even with something like cor coronavirus and flu going around, you get sick it's in jail terrible. and then they get sick. Perfectly healthy, we're able-bodied right. guys mm -hmm. are sitting in jail getting sick. And I'm talking serious sicknesses because right. their immune system is compromised. Mm -hmm. They want to get out. And yeah, sad. That's one of the saddest things to mm -hmm. me. Um, another advantage of pleading guilty is that it cuts down on your legal expenses. You don't have to pay yeah. an attorney I've for that had a lot of people that pled guilty the, because they know they did it. I love it when somebody's done it. They, they don't even bother hiring an attorney. They're just like, you know what? I did it. They know the law. They're pretty right. savvy. Right. And they're just like, you know, I'm going to, uh, they listen to what their, their, their options are through the prosecutor. I always advise getting an attorney first, at least staying one extra month if you need to get a court appointed. But if not, a lot of them will plead that day. That day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when a criminal defendant pleads guilty, when they're represented by legal counsel, not just on their own like you were talking about, I think that's what you were just talking about, mm -hmm. uh, this process involves the criminal defense lawyer and the prosecutor reaching an agreement mm -hmm. and uh, in exchange for the guilty plea. Mm -hmm. and the criminal defendant may receive a lighter sentence be because of that. Now, if you get a public defender or if you get a court appointed, mm -hmm. um, that is, they are your friend, and they will not do anything, and they cannot do by, by per the ethics rules for right. the Texas bar or whatever bar, if they're doing federal, you know, where they're licensed. Um, they can only do what you ask them to do. They cannot talk you into taking it. They, can bu they can't bully you into anything. Uh, they must discuss your case, and if there is a defense, then they're 
they are responsible for looking up that defense. They are paid by the state to do that if they're appointed. And you are deemed financially, uh, it's financially necessary for you to have a court appointed. Otherwise, and I see this happen all the time too, if you tell the court that you don't have money for an attorney and then they give you a court appointed, but then you mess up on your on your uh, bail and you're back in jail again, and then you, they put a really high bail knowing that you'll stay there because because you're, you're going to run or whatever, mm-hmm. and then you turn around and meet that bail, you're going to lose all your court-appointed attorneys or that benefit, and they're going to know you lied because yeah. where'd the money come from? Right. So, because they ask you, can you borrow money? And then suddenly you you can borrow $15,000 to get out, and you didn't have any money before. So you got to be really, really careful about that kind of thing. You don't want to lie to the court ever. Mm-hmm. The minute the judge has lost trust in you, they are, uh, the, the judges, particularly in Harris County, mm-hmm. are actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. They're pretty nice to your mm-hmm. defendants, more right. so than they are in Montgomery County and in Chambers and in Waller. Uh, but they're also still pretty nice. They're empathetic. Um, but if they if they think you're lying to them, oh, they are mad, and they will throw the book at you. They will make your bail so high because you're dishonest. Mm-hmm. That's the worst. I mean, the truth and character is so much so very important. So say nothing or tell the truth, very, very important. But but do um, do know that uh, we were talking about bail. What were mm-hmm. we talking about? We were talking about you know the plea plea deal uh, negotiation. Oh, plea deal negotiation. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, also, pleading guilty avoids the uncertainty of trial. Juries can be unpredictable. We know that. Mm-hmm. You've got a slam dunk case. You know you've got the defense that's going to win, and then you get a jury that that I guess this happened with uh, what's it Stone. Was it Roger Stone? He had a juror on, uh, he was the uh, Trump's uh, 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 representative, or Uh I I forgot exactly Uh what his position was, but he was found guilty in federal court for something, and I should know this, but I've got too many cases going on right now. And it ends up that he had a jury, and one of the jurors was very, very, the the main juror, the the, um, lead the, foreman. Uh, the foreman, foreman was um, had been tweeting that you know very much anti-Trump. I mean, she's very biased, and they gave him I think nine years, uh, seven to nine years in. That was the offer, I guess, in in federal prison for mm-hmm. lying to Congress. I think it was, mm-hmm. and um, which is unheard of. I mean, people commit perjury on the stand all the time. I have so many clients when I've gone to trial that are infuriated because they know that we can prove they committed perjury and nothing ever happened. So they're using him as an example. But but if you've got a juror, that I'm talking about why they're unpredictable, that you've gone through all of the voir dire and you've determined that there's no bias, and then you find out after the fact that there was a strong bias, it's a lot of work to find out if, if they were biased after the fact. You've got to have a lot of money to be able to pay for um, somebody to go into the records and find out if they lied during Vore Dyer. I mean, that's a lot. So right. not only uh, will jurors lie to get on the scene if there's something that's really strong in their heart, jurors are bad too. Right. Um, but you also may have missed something in your case that the jury decides they know better than anybody else. Right. And they pick up on it, and then and then they, they take it a direction you would never have imagined. So you can win some and you can lose some. But they're yeah, it's so unpredictable. unpredictable that and also, you know, a prosecutor could come up with some evidence that you didn't know you thought that had been which hidden. They, they're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to give you all their Brady material. Right. But the way they present it is a certain is depends on, on how the jury takes it. And and I think even more importantly, we talked about on the last few shows, is your expert. If you can't get your expert in so the jury can see from an expert what's going on, whether it be for DNA or from a psychological standpoint, or what the law is on this, or statistics, or, or whatever it may be, a gun expert that, you know, did or didn't work. If you can't get that in um, because of some legal, maybe a mistake, uh, or, or a bias on the judge's part, that, that, so they won't let it in, then then you could lose your case on a technicality, and although it could get overturned, you may be in jail for seven years before you're exonerated. Right. In other words, you may get a prison sentence and then you appeal it and are exonerated, but you've already lost 10 years of your life. Right, so, right. Yeah, juries are very unpredictable, and that's got to be very clear to all of our And uh, in Trolls Republic, you know, there's the whole ordeal of that. Some people, it matters more than others. Some right. are more private than others. Right. But that's something that you need to consider. Yeah, and also if you've got somebody that doesn't like you and it's public, there's not a law against you disclosing that information to the papers later, whether it comes out that you had a, you know, a... a 
uh, STD uh, in a divorce. Right. And your ex is still mad because she didn't get everything she wanted in the settlement. Mm -hmm. And she decides she's going to disclose this to all your friends. Well, it's not a lie. It's the truth. Right. Uh, How how are you going to fight that? So Mm -hmm. it's very public. you got to be really careful if you want to keep your private information private, which is why a lot of very well-off, Divorces are very quietly done and then sealed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so there's some cons of pleading guilty. We're talking about the pros, but certain risks that are associated with pleading guilty. Uh, Innocent people may be subjected to criminal punishments, Mm -hmm. such as having to go to jail and pay fines for crimes that they did not commit. Furthermore, they will now have a criminal record that follows them for the rest of their life. So that's a a con. And a misdemeanor is one thing, and people will forgive that unless it was a crime of moral turpitude like theft or well, so many things GWI. are classified as crimes right. of moral but turpitude once you now. get that felony and uh, so many people uh particularly my younger clients mm-hmm. they don't recognize that a felony is going to ruin their life they can't get credit they can't get I know, housing i know they can't get a job that right. felony follows you forever and then they want to come back and get a writ to get rid of it and it's right. nearly impossible you can't do it mm-hmm. yeah uh, in some jurisdictions, too, we have statutory minimums that the prosecutor can't get around. I, I personally disagree with so much of this stuff. This means that the I mean, I agree it's true, right. but I disagree with the morality of it. Mm. This means that the criminal defendant will be required to serve a, sort, a certain sentence, even if the prosecutor and the criminal offense, mm-hmm. a criminal defense lawyer, agree otherwise. And I will say this on the on the side of the victim. I've had a, several cases the where the victim of the crime, or yeah, the, the Victim. criminal uh, the victim in in this case because normally I'm so you know, I'm criminal defense so I can see where you know um, it always seems like it's unfavorable to somebody that that just made a, a mistake and it wasn't from the heart and it was just a bad decision whether it through, be through depression or maybe they weren't in the right mind or mm-hmm. you know something happened that was that made it very excusable um, but sometimes you have a victim of a crime and and the 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 perpetrator doesn't get the punishment by the jury because they're so sympathetic that they should have gotten. And that's devastating. And I have one where I had a, a, a murder and he only got 15 years, and it's coming up on the 11th year, and they have to fight every year to keep him in jail because that 15-year mark is coming up. And they thought he would die in jail, and I guess only the good die young. This guy's going to get out and be free after uh, murdering somebody intentionally in cold blood and then trying to kill her husband. And so um, sometimes you are glad that there's a mandatory minimum. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. goes both ways. Um, not me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, also, I think we touched on this before. The prosecutor and the defense attorney can agree on something, and the court disagrees. And the that judge can me last impose month. a. Right, you were telling me the judge we can impose a had, longer sentence than what the two attorneys agreed on. Yeah, and so you can approach generally. They let you do this in Harrison County. I don't know if I've done this in Montgomery County or not. Um, but but uh, you. If first, if the prosecutors just won't work with you on anything, then you can go and approach the judge. What's called without an agreed rec- recommendation, and the judge will give you an idea before he actually sentences them and what he would give them, and then you know whether or not you want to take that agreed without an agreed rec. They they usually be nice enough to give you a you know a heads up, and and particularly in election years, the judges are really harsh. So it may not be what you want to do, and you just kind of want to work it out. If you look like there's just that they did the crime, and you've just got to you know it's usually DWIs or drug possession or an assault where it was mutual combat or something where it's you've got a really, really sympathetic victim or something's going on like that. Right. But I had one, and the judge, it was a, a very reasonable deal. And and, um, and the prosecutor wouldn't agree with you? No, the prosecutor they did. Was, did agree with me, and we thought it was still a little harsh, but we were, we were very happy to take what we could get with this. And the judge said no because it was an election year. And then we called the... Um, the probation officer that actually did the uh, what's called a TRAS, it's determined whether or not what t- whether they're a high risk for recidivity, recipro- uh, recidivity where they ca- whether they come back again or not, mm-hmm. and whether they need some counseling and what the probation term should be. And she had given him a pretty good recommendation, but the judge wouldn't go with it. And so we had to go back, and he said, "You need to give me more." And so we went back literally and got. 30 affidavits from everybody, from his church and from his employer and from really? his... Really? And we, to tell you that this is really harsh and you need to give him a break. And we still don't know what the outcome is going to be, but um, but you have to do what you can do because the alternative is taking the minimum. And in this particular case, the minimum, um, if you... The minimum for this crime was was overwhelmingly unfair for for what he did, um, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was um, 
oh, it was a, a third DWI. But in this particular case, the, the, <coughs> we had a really good case going to trial because he was actually asleep while the car was running, but he wasn't, he was on a street, but it really wasn't a public street. It was kind of going into subdivision. There's a lot of uh, affirmative defenses where it looks right. like we could try to go and fight it, but we didn't want to fight it because he would be in jail the whole time. And um, really good guy. He was 30 DWI, but it was, he was 15 years out from the second, and that was 15 years out from oh, the first. So oh. it, it, it was it was just mm-hmm. hard worker, loved by everybody, a stellar, you know, a citizen, except for this one incident. And it was kind of a fluke because he was really, really depressed. And so there, there was a lot of things going on with it, and it was just really sad that he couldn't get, you know, something less than the minimum. But... That's that's what the law that's what the law is. So sometimes the judge won't take it, and and there you, know, you are. You have to go with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there are pros and cons of going to trial as well. Um, going to trial also has several advantages. I mean, we've talked about a lot mm-hmm. of those. Uh, it buys the criminal defendant more time to prepare his or her defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, juries typically usually get it right if they pay attention. They do. If they pay mm-hmm. attention, I've won so many trials where they got it right, and I'm. I'm, it's just a great feeling when they get it right. Mm-hmm. But then, but then, when when you when you know you, you've got everything on your side, you as an attorney, you're. That's why there's a lot of. That's why with our uh, the state bar has got a, a helpline for attorneys. You're devastated because you don't know who to answer to. You don't. You don't have an answer. You did everything right, and then you still got a bad decision, and you don't know what to do right. except pray. You know. Right. Uh, it's also the only way. Going to trial and getting acquitted is the only way for a criminal defendant to escape all responsibility. Right. You get acquitted. Right. If you work at a deal, you've still got a statute of limitations where right. they can bring it back again. Right. right. Another benefit of going to trial is that the criminal defendant receives all the benefits of the United States Constitution. They are presumed innocent, right. supposedly. Right. Right. Now, mm-hmm. there are some cons. Uh, criminal defendants who decide to go to trial place themselves in the precarious position mm-hmm. of putting their lives in the hands of a jury. An unpredictable jury, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Or maybe an, an ineffective counsel. Uh Mm Uh-huh. Juries are difficult to predict. They also face the maximum penalty for the crime. So, you know, I think, Tony, that's why people plea all the time. It's because they're scared of that maximum penalty. There's a lot more leverage because if you go to a jury, it takes off the table um, uh, many times probation, which is very, very important because you're free while you're just, you have some conditions to your probation, but at least you have a life. Right. And it's just like a little side job that you're doing this if you're a good person. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have drug problems though, and it doesn't help them. And they really need to be in because they need the counseling, which is another thing. It's another defense. Sometimes my clients need to be in jail because because it's cheaper than the medical care that they would need for the rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And they go through these programs and they, I'm telling you, I have clients that have that they're still sending me thank you notes because they were in the Harris County program that they did not want to be in, mm-hmm. and they were they over their addictions, and so it does mm. work sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. Also, you can have a criminal defense, a court appointed attorney mm-hmm. that's super busy, mm-hmm. or you can have a private attorney that's very expensive. So that's right, another right. con. Are uh, very expensive to, to and trial. maybe giving their work to somebody that's lower and they haven't done the work right, and something right. happens and there's right. a mistake and right. Yeah, yeah that's true. Mm-hmm. Okay, so and I will say another thing: when you when you plead guilty, it takes off the table your ability uh, on appeal. Your your uh, mm. if if you've already pled guilty, right. uh, to, you've taken uh, you've already. Con- I mean, they wait, they will shut you down when you go to the appellate. How are you going to explain to an appellate court that you were coerced into making a plea when you've signed all these papers and everything's explained to you so thoroughly now? Right. So a lot of times if you you roll the dice going to a jury, but if there was a mistake made and you were innocent, as bad as it is, this is how people get exonerated because they go to jail and they're found guilty improperly. They, they, they're doing the time. The Innocence Project kicks in because the DNA didn't match. So if you uphold your innocence... Because you are innocent, and you should all, the truth is what will set you free. Sometimes you do the time, but eventually your name will be cleared if, if you do do the right thing. But sometimes people can't tolerate it for all the reasons that we just talked about. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's all I got on uh, the pleading and going to trial the pros and cons. Mm-hmm. Now, we were going to do our little <coughs> question and answer thing, but I did want to go over just briefly... Um, when you can assert your Fifth Amendment right, because that was something of interest to me. And people always say, I'm taking the Fifth, I'm taking the Fifth. Mm -hmm. And you can't just take the Fifth. Mm -hmm. But let me ask uh, Station Manager Dick real quick, how much more time do we have? Oh, we have to wrap up. Oh, no. 
Fifth Amendment rights. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about Fifth Amendment rights next week. Okay. Because I, I want to talk about the Fifth Amendment rights next week and when you can assert them, because you can't always assert them. Um, is Bitcoin legal? Why it's important? Um, what is money laundering and why is it illegal and the ways you can do it? If you, if you may be doing it and not even know it, but most people know they're money laundering. Uh, probation violations and what to expect. If, you're, if your attorney was so good, they got you probation, but you violate it, what you can legitimately expect. Okay, that sounds great. Well, listen, guys, thanks for listening. Tony and I have been here today talking about uh, playing guilty, pros and cons of going to trial, and all that sort of stuff. Next week, we're going to talk about... Fifth Amendment, mm -hmm. Bitcoin, money laundering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we want to remind you to... Serve God by serving others. Have a great week. <laughs>